The Studi is a beauty that is different by design. Up front, you'll find high style to the grill. Clean, sweeping lines, that's a rear wheel beauty without frills. Different by design, the Studi is a beauty that is different by design. More headroom, even space for hats, the convenient floors are flat. Up with a bunch of different designs. Um, and Steve was just well aware, I think I have a little quote here, pop that up. Um, he said, Today's Jeep could become tomorrow's popular car with a minimum of tooling and fabrication costs. So, again, he's out to save his clients money, right, to, to find a way to uh, you know, deliver a new, unique vehicle that appeals to the American public um, for uh, you know, minimum cost. And so, um, you know, Jeep couldn't afford necessarily, or Willis Overland, to go ahead and retool and, and redo their entire plans, and so he was trying to use what they already had. Um, but that's not to say he didn't come up with some pretty wild ideas. This is one of the more moderate ideas after World War II. We call it the Victory Car, a design for an all-wheel drive civilian Jeep, uh, and that's in 1942, I believe. So he was already thinking about post-war during the war, right? Um, and so we have an advertisement on the bottom here for a Jeepster. Um, we do have a Jeepster in the exhibit right now. So that was one vehicle produced um, in the 1940s. Um, and then on the top left there is a sort of schematic for a, um, like a station wagon uh, that uh, eventually was not produced, but was later on was produced using Stevens' uh, uh, ideas for, for that vehicle. So um, pretty interesting. And I don't have an image of it up here. But this is also an era after World War II, a lot of other American automakers are looking at these prophetic future, crazy bubble topped cars, right? Um, and Stevens was, you know, sure, those are really interesting, but you know, after the war, not many automakers are going to be able to, you know, afford to do something so wild. And, um, and so he tried to restrain it a little bit and, and kind of bring it in. All right, many of you may have seen this before too. This is one of my favorite, um, designed, vehicle designed by Stevens outside of his work for Studebaker, which we'll get to. Um, so this is the Olympian Hiawatha passenger train. And so um, this was a, a very large project. Uh, we're talking about an entire fleet of, you know, locomotives here. Um, and so uh, we're talking about everything from the interior to the exterior. But the most noticeable part of the thing I think he was most proud of, um, actually I'll use the, I can use the laser here was this sky top lounge here, right? Um, and so, you know, this is in the, kind of the more glamorous era of sort of, um, you know, cross country, I guess, uh, rail travel. And so you wanted to have, you know, design something that really had, um, you know, mass appeal, was very comfortable and, you know, luxurious on the inside. And so he ended up, you know, designing this um, fully enclosed with all these windows um, sky top lounge that would go at the back of the uh, Olympian Hiawatha. Um, and when I say top to bottom, re like styling, they did everything from the interior tables and chairs, you know, to the flooring, um, to the uniforms of the, the staff on the, on the train. So it's really a little bit of everything. There we go. All right, just a couple more images there of the actual um, engine and then the, the rear of the, uh, of the train. So yeah, these were one of the, the streamliner passenger trains. All right, uh, he's in Milwaukee, right? So it would be silly not to at some point do something with Harley Davidson. So, um, and he, believe it or not, he didn't do a ton with Harley. Um, I know they, they have their own designers, but from time to time, you know, he was contracted to do uh, various things. Um, so I think the most well-known example here is our 1949 Hyperglide, um, really classic American motorcycle. Um, he's not responsible for the entire styling and design of this motorcycle, but there are elements um, that we know he did and his firm did work on. Um, quote, I think, here over here. Oh, just to point out, yeah, there's the nameplate there, um, that this is the actual patent for that nameplate um, from Brooks Stevens Associates. And I love this quote. Um, so people want motorcycles to look like motorcycles, right? You could have all sorts of futuristic ideas about what you think a motorcycle should be, but really, Let's create a really cool looking motorcycle. And so um, some other things he was responsible for, um, you know, uh, the square sort of fender skirt here, the, the sort of headlight mount up here. It's hard to see from this image, but um, there's like this sort of big single gauge here on the, um, above the gas tank. Um, he also designed that teardrop shape of the gas tank. So a lot of stuff kind of clustered toward the front of the bike there. So. And we have one of these upstairs too, I think in this exact color scheme. So you can go see it. 
getting a workout with my arm today. That's fairly okay. Um, yeah, and we'll move on to some of his other clients, um, you know, in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, so Kaiser Frazier, one of um, many of you are probably familiar with, with this company. Um, again, like, like Studebaker, one of a very handful of independent car, um, car makers uh, in the country, um, again, competing against the big three after World War II. Um, and Stephen was brought in as a consultant in 1947. Um, they knew of his work with Willie Zoberlind um, and through his connections to the McCulloch Corporation and Henry Kaiser's business interests, um, he was able to, uh, you know, to come on board as a designer. Um, and so there, there's some disagreement at this point, kind of who designed what between, uh, between Stevens and Howard Dutch Darren. Many of you may be familiar with him from his time at Kaiser Frazier. Um, and uh, one of my favorite quotes that at this time period, um, you know, because again, there's some disagreement about who designed what, um, uh, Stephen said, Dutch is unable to draw a straight line with the ruler. So you can tell they really <laughs> did, didn't get along very well. So. Um, and so you can see he did make some minor styling adjustments to the 1949 uh, sedan line, uh, and then uh, him and his firm began a kind of an overhaul of um, the, all of the Kaiser, um, Kaiser models for 1950, especially with their auto show exhibits and uh, dealer showroom displays. So um, he did, con uh, he went on to work for, you know, later on, we know Kaiser Frazier, Willis Overland, you know, came together in the 50s. Uh, and he worked on some cab over engine vehicles for um, that new, newly reconstituted company at that point um, based on some Jeeps. So just one example of his automotive work. All right, we'll talk a little bit about some, uh, some other custom automobiles. Um, and some of these are just striking and very, very unique and very, very Brooke Stevens. Um, and so the one on the left uh, is, is called the DeValkyrie Coupe from 1954. Um, so Stevens really, really wanted to be well known among the European um, auto design sort of circles. Um, again, to, to kind of get his name out there and gain more credibility. And so um, the fastest way to do that um, was to, again, build a, a unique car and, and tour it in the auto shows in Europe. And so uh, this one on, like I said, the De Valkyrie Coupe um, from 1954, it's, it's a sports car. It's built on a Cadillac chassis. Um, by a Hermann Spohn of Ravensburg, Germany, um, and then with financial backing from a Cleveland City Councilman. Um, and he first called this the Excalibur, which we'll come back to in a few minutes. Um, the name Excalibur pops up quite a bit, uh, but he eventually decided on this Valkyrie term because of that deep sort of V shape in the, the front bumper uh, and the Cadillac V8 engine. Um, so very, very modern, very well received at, at France. It was very, very expensive um, to manufacture this car, about $10,000 in that 54 money. Um, so I didn't do the math, but a lot today. Um, he did purchase one for his wife, um, who kept it for many, many years as her sort of driver, um, but there were very few of these actually manufactured. So, um, so it's sort of a custom, custom automobile. Uh, the one on the right uh, is a Gaylord Grand Prix. Um, there's a great book if you're interested on more of um, Stephen's work by Glenn Adamson from 2003. He goes into great detail about some of um, Stephen's custom automobile work. Um, Adamson calls uh, the uh, Gaylord Grand Prix the apex of Stevens' uh, career in a custom automobile design. It kind of is everything that Stephen um, <coughs> Stephen loved about automobiles there in kind of one vehicle. So, um, yeah, this car was funded by two wealthy patrons from the Chicago area, and the entire car was planned out, sketched out, um, designed before a price was ever discussed. So you can imagine this was not not a cheap not a cheap car. Um, but really, really unique sort of styling features here. Um, has these huge sort of dinner plate sized headlights that you can kind of see there on the, on the uh, toward the front. Um, you know, the sort of radiator grill. You'll see a lot in Stevens' design. He very much was a fan of this sort of contemporary classic look, right? Um, going back to the 1930s with, you know, Mercedes, Auburn Accords, and we'll see more of that as you go along. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I love the front fender there that kind of carve out that sort of niche for the front wheel. So. Very, very unique vehicle. Uh, a couple more here to show you. So the Cinetar um, was actually a, a, a pretty interesting project as well. Um, so he was uh, contracted by a, a manufacturer called Olin Mathiasen. It's an aluminum manufacturer um, to you know, demonstrate the efficiency of building cars with aluminum, right? 
And so that sounds really cool, right? It's lightweight. Um, you know, this was a, a metal that was being used in all sorts of applications at the time, um, including the automobile industry. And Stevens did have some experience working with aluminum, you know, smaller kitchen appliances and whatnot. Um, and uh, so could, could aluminum be used in a cost-effective manner to build a car? The short answer is no, not really. Um, and so he, he kind of uh, experimented, but what he did do, which I think is really interesting, is he basically designed this car so that uh, the sort of uh, pieces, right, the segments, the stamps, could be interchangeable and used on three different models, right, based on like the same, the same panels, which is, which is kind of neat. And so um, there were three different models, so a two-door hardtop, uh, like a convertible town car, uh, a station wagon, and then a sports car with a, like a three-way route. So he designed this this sort of vehicle in different configurations to try to save money, but it was still incredibly expensive. So, um, and so we don't have many existing examples of this car, but it's really, really interesting. So. All right, so we'll go on here um, past some of his custom automobile work. He worked for a long, long time. Even Rude or uh, OMC was the sort of umbrella organization outboard. Uh, Motor, or Marine Motor Company, um, for most of his career, they were one of his longer lasting, sort of reliable clients. And so um, some of his, his designs for Evenrude are some of my favorite because they're just, some of them are very utilitarian and some are just off the wall. Um, and so this uh, is Evenrude Lark over here. Oops, let me get that, there we go. Um, on the left, so this was a, a display for um, the uh, boat show circuit, the National Boat Show Circuit, circuit in uh, the mid 1950s for Evenrude. Um, so really, what they're trying to sell are their outboard engines, okay? Um, but Stevens was like, no one is going to come in and want to buy just an outboard engine on a display with a bunch of dusty salesmen trying to convince you to buy this. So he designed a boat and then attached these engines to the boat, and then he's like, well, look how cool and sexy the boat is. Doesn't it make you want to buy one of these, right? So. Um, so there's a whole line of these, um, called the even rude lark or shriekers is another name for them, um, with these crazy fins and really, really elegant lines and, and it's, it's kind of a beautiful boat, um, really just to market and sell these outboard engines. Um, and of all of their work for even rude, um, they basically sort of styled um, and updated all of even rude's outboard engines for decades, right? And so they'd make minor styling changes to, you know, the upper part of the motor, the part that's above the water, um, but really that was a very, like I said, very uh, reliable commission for them. Uh, on the right is an example of a, a house float he built um, in the late 1950s. Really, really interesting um, sort of idea here. Uh, the notion was, again, this is an era where, you know, you see the middle, the burgeoning middle class, right? Um, more and more people can afford uh, more leisure activities and leisure vehicles, and so the idea was, uh, okay, you buy one of these houseboats and as your family expands, you can add on to it. It was modular, right? And so he would also, again, um, you know, use these examples to try and sell the outboard. So they were always powered by even root outboard engines, but they were also just kind of kind of crazy. Uh, another example of a snowmobile. He created quite a few snowmobiles for, uh, for OMC. All right, we talked about Oscar Mayer a little bit. Uh, hey, there you go. So. Um, these were uh, some original promo shots of his design for the Wienermobile. And so um, he did not come up with this idea originally. So there was a, <laughs> there was a, uh, I guess, a hot dog car before this, um, but he uh, affectionately said he was the one who actually put the Wiener in the bun. And so, um, <laughs> and so you, yeah. <laughs> I swear to God, I said it. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, again, he designed this as a, as a fiberglass body uh, in two halves, and they're joined there. And then um, the original design had this sort of bubble cockpit, which again, going back to the early, you know, late 1940s, early 1950s, very space age, very cool looking, but it's really not practical. Uh, it leaks and it's hotter than hell, right? Um, it just traps all that sunlight. And so um, in later versions, you'll see that they redesigned the, the Wiener Mobile a little bit, but um, the iconic shape is, is still with us. All right, so many of you are probably like, but he worked for Studebaker, right? That's why we're here. Um, he did, and so uh, I'll talk for a few minutes about his work for Studebaker. Um, and so by this point, this is the early 1960s, um, you know, Studebaker had historically employed Raymond Lowy, right, um, for many, many years as sort of uh, their contracted designer. Um, Lowy was very, very talented, came up with very, uh, and his firm, uh, many, many of Studebaker's more iconic designs, right? Um, 
but by the way, 1950s, early 60s, Studebaker Packard, right, had an in-house design staff again, okay? And they really couldn't afford um, Raymond Lowy's, you know, frankly, exorbitant fees, right? And so uh, the president of Studebaker at the time, Sherwood Egbert, was looking for, you know, we need to bring someone on to help sort of redesign our two sort of bread and butter models, right? We have the Studebaker, Lark, and the Hawk, right? They'd both been around for a few years, um, but they were in desperate need of just some, some TLC. At a time where the company, you know, they were struggling, right? I mean, let's be real. And so, um, so he knew Stevens on a personal level. Um, from uh, Egbert at one point he worked for the McCullough Corporation, so, and so Stevens had, had done design work for them, redesigned their corporate headquarters, and so the two men had, did know each other. Um, and, uh, you know, Egbert was impressed with Stevens' work on uh, the William Carroll, and, and there were other things as well. And so um, Stevens had a budget of about $7 million, which is really not much money at all, um, to redesign um, a, a large automaker's two main models here. And so um, he did a lot with very little money. And so um, his main contributions to the Lark initially were really just to, uh, you know, make it a little bit longer, it's a little bit longer, um, some minor styling on the outside, new instrument panel, new grill, new hood ornament, things like that. Um, I think we can all agree his work on the Hawk was a little more um, impactful, a little more drastic. And so you can see, if you're familiar with the Studebaker Hawks before this, uh, the Gran Turismo is a, is a pretty radical departure from what came before. Um, and it's one of my favorite Studebaker car uh, designs. Just it's just it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful car to look at. Um, and so uh, so yeah, uh, we have one here on display. So I encourage you all to go check that out. Um, so I mean, the first thing I noticed, he, he, there are a few things really, but he uh, kind of cut off the fins, right? Love him or hate him, I don't think he liked them. So he cut off the fins. He squared off the roof line here. Um, so you notice it's a hard top model. Um, he made some changes on the front end, including incorporating this sort of vertical grill into the existing uh, Hawk hood line there. Um, and he removed some of the, you know, some of the side chrome trim and whatnot. So it's a little more streamlined, a little more subtle, um, but I think a very, very beautiful car. So um, if it will look here. All right, a couple more examples of just some design sketches for um, his work on the Lark. Uh, and for the Hawk here. I love this one. This actually is courtesy of um, the Milwaukee Art Museum's archives. They have um, possession of um, most of his um, papers and design drawings. And so I love this, uh, this sketch. It kind of blows out all the different components um, and things that they've, you know, uh, designed new for the, for the GT Hawk, which I thought was kind of neat. And this is actually not the final configuration of this car, but again, it shows you the thinking and the iteration that's involved in coming to an actual final product, so. All right, um, we do have a GT Hawk here. Um, the fun part of this is the car we have here was bought new by Brooke Stevens. Um, and so there is a black um, 64 GT Hawk upstairs right now. Um, this image on the left, There we go, there's Stevens there. Um, so uh, the gentleman who donated this vehicle to us, Ron DeWinter, um, he owned the car for many, many years. Um, but before that, it was in Stevens' collection um, and he bought it new from Studebaker. So you can see uh, it's changed appearance a little bit. This picture was the car at a, at a car show in the late 1970s. Um, and so we're very fortunate to have this car in the collection today. Um, it's just kind of a neat connection back to, back to Brooks. So. <coughs> There we go. Um, and I think the, the other part of this and his work with Studebaker is his really looking at, um, you know, the future product line, right? These are, these are vehicles that never, you know, saw the light of day, but there, there are three prototypes in our collection here today as part of the exhibit. Um, Stevens, the writing was on the wall a little bit um, by, the, by like 1963. I mean, he was, again, doing his, uh, his best to kind of Push, push the envelope and look forward to 1965 and 66, like what would the future Studebaker lineup look like? Um, again, Studebaker would fold shortly thereafter. He was working on these projects, but um, he still continued to do, um, to do this work. And so on the top left here, uh, we see the Studebaker Scepter. Um, so that was a concept of prototype vehicle. Um, some pretty, uh, pretty dramatic um, styling on this. Uh, it's got this sort of razor, 
um, sort of cross vehicle grill here. It's got these tubular headlights that go all the way across. Um, the interior is very futuristic looking. It's got like bubble gauges and this fold out vanity and uh, it, it's very streamlined. I mean, it's very slick. Um, so this vehicle is, uh, is again, part of our collection on display upstairs right now. Uh, he also was attempting to restyle um, the Lark even further ahead here, again, looking at 1965 and 66. And so looking at ways that were cost effective for the company, you know, to create a sort of new car based on their existing um, sort of part supply and tooling and all that. And so it had interchangeable doors and things like that. Um, and then down here, it's a pretty unique car. This is a Skyview wagon, another prototype developed by Stevens. Um, it has this really, really cool um, retractable roof that would go into production later on the, the wagon air. Um, but again, this was, uh, uh, again, a prototype wagon that never, that never saw production. But three very, very unique vehicles that we're lucky to, to still have around. Um, and that's largely because Brooks had his own auto collection, right, in Mequon, Wisconsin. Um, and so these vehicles and many others were part of his collection um, until I believe they closed in the late 90s. All right, uh, and I'm going to end the Studebaker era here, um, looking at um, a very, very sort of interesting part of the story. So this vehicle on the left here um, looks like an old Mercedes SSK or something. Again, going back to Steven's sort of love of this era, this is a show car um, produced for the 1964 New York Auto Show for Studebaker. So in all, for all intents and purposes, it is a Studebaker. It's built with Studebaker parts on a Lark Daytona chassis. It has GT Hawk and Avanti elements to it, um, and obviously a custom body, right? Uh, this was made for the auto show um, very quickly. I mean, like he was very proud of this design, and as they were sort of loading this car into, you know, um, to be shown at the auto show, uh, Studebaker said, no, we, you can't do that, um, because they had just announced they were closing their doors and stopped stopping producing automobiles here in South Bend. And so this car actually was not shown at the, uh, at the auto show for Studebaker, but Stevens uh, was pretty resolute. He wanted to get the car out in front of people. And so this is how the Excalibur, um, really how the Excalibur automobile company came to be. Um, and so uh, he showed the car under his own label, his own name, right? And actually took, uh, I think 10 or 12 orders for um, what he was calling the Excalibur, um, which is a company that existed well into the 1980s, uh, making these high-end uh, luxury vehicles, um, these contemporary classics. Um, you know, uh, have an image. I'll, sh I'll show you another image in a minute. Um, but yeah, this is another part of his legacy. Uh, he wasn't directly involved with Excalibur his entire life. Um, it was a, a company that he spun off, but very, very interesting part of his career. Uh, but he was also a big racing uh, fan, and so you can see uh, over here in 1952, we have the Excalibur J race car um, that's built on a, a Ka Kaiser Henry J chassis. But you can see um, it actually competed in various uh, road races. Um, I think it won like the New York uh, Grand Prix in 1953 or 54, I want to say. So uh, he was involved in racing very early on. And then you have another example here, the Excalibur Hawk race car from 1962. So in this 10 or 12-year period, he was pretty heavily involved in racing. Um, that was a big part of uh, uh, what took up a lot of his time. So. All right, there's an example um, of another. Uh, this is a um, Excalibur uh, based on a 30s era Bugatti. You can kind of see the resemblance there. Um, I think they made, uh, I have to look at my notes, but many of these. Uh, but again, these, these were very, very expensive cars. And so, um, you know, they made them in various different style uh, models, but uh, not many people were really in the market for, for something like this. All right, uh, later in life, just a quick, quick look at some of his other automobiles. So um, I think if you take away nothing else, I mean, beyond his work for Studebaker, I mean, he was very ahead of his time, especially with these, what we call today an SUV. Um, and so this is an early Jeep Wagoneer from 1980, a concept rendering. Um, I mean, the, it's changed very little, right? I mean, you can see the bones of uh, the modern Jeep in this vehicle right here from 1980. Um, and so I think in, in many ways, uh, Stevens was the uh, progenitor of the modern SUV. Uh, another kind of interesting vehicle he did, he worked for Briggs and Stratton, 
um, for many years um, doing different projects. Uh, this is a hybrid electric automobile that he designed for them. Uh, it's terribly ugly, but I mean, it's ahead, ahead of its time um, in, in terms of thinking about hybrid um, vehicles as, as an alternative to, and this is again, look at the time in the late 1970s, um, kind of around the era of the gas crisis, the oil crisis and whatnot. Uh, he also worked for American Motors um, for several years doing different projects. So here, here he is in the full-size model, um, clay model of a 1972 AMC American in the late 1960s. So uh, there's many more things I could share. We just don't have time today for the, the other vehicles. So we're going to go on and look at, um, well, toasters, but other things as well. So. <laughs> so All right. Um, so a few examples here. Uh, I, lo I love this rendering for this uh, mixer over here because really it looks just like what a lot of you probably have on your countertops, including myself right now. Um, this particular um, appliance was never actually manufactured, but um, pop up some really quick. Um, thinking through, come on, there we go. Get the light. Um, thinking through the materials in the design process, like in, in the 1940s. Um, plastics were being used in various applications in many industries, and Stephen saw the advantage. Bakelite was used a lot in appliances. Um, it definitely had its advantages for durability and keeping it clean and whatnot, um, but he wasn't going to use material just because everyone else was using it. Um, he wanted to find the right material for the job, but he did use plastics in, in several of his concepts. Um, so we'll see, yes, the, the kitchen mixer here. He made quite a few of these um, radios for Traveler and other companies. Um, we have one on display upstairs right now. We have a halo gas heater. All right. um, again, keeping it in the sort of domestic sphere here. Um, he also did work for Miro. Um, this is a test kitchen to promote their products. Uh, and then a Miro Manhattan um, piece of cookware here in the late 1960s. Um, we're getting into, into an era where a lot of American appliance makers wanted things in you know, avocado and harvest gold. And Stevens was not a fan of that, but he lost a lot of those battles. So, um, but he did design things, um, you know, again from serving dishes to coffee percolators, things like that. So. Come on. I find just the right angle here. So. That's not it. There we go. All right. Okay, there we go. Um, so. So other product designs, um, just a few examples here of um, not necessarily things that made it into production, but just to give you a sense of, again, they were he was ahead of his time in a lot of ways. And so this is a rendering for a Hamilton brand refrigerator um, in the early 1940s. Um, I think this is really interesting because it has this sort of see-through corner compartment there so you can see, see what's still in your fridge, right? Um, and what you need to go out and get. Um, and I think you're seeing kind of more of this on modern fridges, but this was very, very ahead of its time. And again, you got the nice big sort of cursive chrome luxury script look here. Um, shut up in here. All right. We also have um, the front loading clothes dryer was another um, pretty unique invention uh, at the time. You didn't see front loading clothes dryers before the early 1940s, and Stevens was at the vanguard of that. And so you see an early example um, of a Hamilton clothes dryer. Um, another rendering um, from him that, you know, something a little more off the wall, but sort of this bubble top clothes dryer, so you can see your clothes being dried. Um, but uh, you, you can see that the thought process as these things kind of um, came into the marketplace, right? So. There we go. That's great. I love this quote, too. If, you, if it looks like you have to have a pilot's license to run the machine, you've lost. <laughs> Which I think is, is again... That sums up for Stevens perfectly. All right, some other sort of domestic products here. Um, so this image up here, this is actually on display right now. I couldn't find a good image of it, so I took an image of the other. Um, so this is a very early example of, a, of all things, a open, like an open wide mouth uh, peanut butter jar, right? Like we all, no one thinks about, okay, where did the wide mouth peanut butter jar come from? Well, it came from more students. And so someone had to think of that, right? And so um, again, the, easier access, easier to get it out, and so we have a nice example here from the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. Um, I, I also mentioned before we have the um, Petty Point clothing iron and that uh, uh, patent for that design. Um, he did also work for a company called Modern Hygiene briefly, um, so this is an example of a, a floor vacuum he designed for them. We also have one of these on display. Um, 
you know, again, things that we might not always think about being styled by a professional designer, um, but again, this is an era where, you know, consumer culture was exploding, right? And so, um, Stevens was very much aware of, uh, of, you know, the changes in American society and, and who they were designing products for. All right, so this is, I, this is awesome, I love this. This is a jukebox, if you're a big jukebox fan, um, this is a really, really unique design. So this is the Gable Hero jukebox from 1940. Um, you can very much see Stevens' architecture training, I think, in this image, um, just with some of the lines. Um, there are very, very few of these left in the world that we know of. Um, they didn't make that many. I think this company folded shortly thereafter and came up with this design. Um, but just a very, very um, good example of this kind of uh, design. All right, um, I think I know Andy mentioned Longboy. Um, so this is kind of fun too. So uh, Longboy um, and OMC, their parent company, I think for uh, many, many years was a client of Stevens. And so what's interesting is like rotary mowers were really, weren't really a thing before this time in the 1960s. Um, it took a while for them to catch on in the marketplace, but Stevens and his staff um, did many, many renderings and designs for different um, Longboy lawnmowers. He loved this green color because um, the grass is green, I don't know, whatever. Um, but uh, it's just kind of neat to see these things um, so so nicely rendered, and we have one upstairs right now. Uh, we do uh, have this image of Stevens and his family, um, his wife, um, Alice, and then they had three boys and one daughter there, uh, sort of posing for this uh, you know, this nice lawn boy advertisement. So. Not sure why they're all wearing Hawaiian clothing. <laughs> All right. Uh, I just love this one. It didn't fit. It didn't fit neatly anywhere. Um, so call it just general product design. Um, so this is the AMF uh, Jet Trike. Um, uh, this is just perfect, right? 1957. Um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of sort of this era of design because it's just so ridiculous. Um, but you have this sort of missile, sort of you know, frame running down the middle. You have these two wings as the handlebars, right? Uh, what looks like um, I don't know the, the front of a you know a vehicle or an airplane here. Um, I don't know if this one ever made it into production, but um, again, very emblematic of this, of this time period. All right, um, so we talk about you know, products. He also did um, work for various companies just re, um, reworking their sort of corporate brand identity, and that's something we think about more today, but it was happening you know, as far back as the 1930s and 40s. And so this is Kudahe of Kudahe, um, uh, you know, food company here. So their entire product line, he helped you know redesign their packaging. Um, again, we're so used to this; it's so ubiquitous. It's around us all the time now that we forget sometimes that you know these were these are designed products you know to, to appeal to to the consumer. Uh, oh, you probably heard of Formica, um, and so this is another another thing I think that flies under the radar. So there's this this famous Skylark pattern um, you've probably seen on a Formica tabletop, right? Um, and so this Skylark was a design of Brooks Stevens Associates. And so um, we don't know for sure he actually designed this pattern, the shape. I mean, someone on his firm did, um, but it soon kind of you know, found its way into everything. Formica was a client of theirs, and so you saw it used a lot on, on this material, which was very modern for the time. Um, it was, I mentioned the Olympian Hiawatha. It was used on tabletops and other things in the train, but also everywhere, right? If you go and search, for my like table right now on Google, I guarantee you one of these patterns will be the first thing you see. All right, well, Andy mentioned beer, so <laughs> sorry I don't have more for you here. Um, yeah, so Miller Brewing, again, a Milwaukee company, right? Um, and so uh, worked with, Mil uh, with, with Miller um, to redesign their product line and packaging in the early 1950s, and so we see um, what they came up with in, in terms of just the, the six pack um, cardboard holder there. Uh, for many years, I know they've been using this girl on the moon sort of logo motif. Um, it was Stevens um, who came up with this sort of, we call it the soft cross, right? This Miller soft cross. And we still see that, right? So it's pretty amazing that this, uh, this logo, this design has um, really stood the test of time and with very little changes, so. I have another, I think, the next slide here. There we go. Is a uh, yeah, Miller Highland Cruiser. So this is all part of this this design package that was uh, created by Brooks Stevens Associates. And so I can just imagine this thing driving around town. Yeah. I guess handing out beer. I don't really know what they were doing. Uh, 
it's hard, hard to miss the giant uh, bottle there on the box. Good. Yeah, and going back just to these other brand designs, right? And so we see, um, you know, the various products for the Scotch Corporation. Um, this is in the 1960s, and so. Um, they did quite a bit of this kind of work. Um, it wasn't always glamorous, right? Um, but these, you know, this is what helped pay the bills um, and continue to make them a powerhouse, I think, in the, in the industry. So. All right, so I did want to briefly talk about his architectural designs. It doesn't, again, doesn't really fit in neatly anywhere. Um, but there were several times throughout his career where, you know, he did have um, aspirations, I think, to become a little more well-known uh, as a, an architect, as an architectural um, designer. And so one of his big projects, really for many, many years, um, was what he wanted to build in Milwaukee. It was a conference center, um, a, the Satellite Towers Hotel Complex. Um, and this thing is, is pretty crazy. I and mean, he envisioned it as kind of putting Milwaukee on the map, you know, next to Lake Michigan, um, hosting, you know, dozens of different conferences and, and, you know, people from all over the world would stay in this complex. Uh, unfortunately, it ran into a lot of local Milwaukee politics and red tape, and so it was never actually built. Um, but there are elements of this, I think, that found it, their way into other projects, um, not necessarily run by Stevens, but um, in other, other places, other people. So, so kind, of, kind of interesting. Uh, this is his home in, uh, right outside of Milwaukee in Fox Point, um, Wisconsin. So designed, built in 1940. Um, you know, very modern, right? I mean, in 1940, um, you know, I can imagine in a neighborhood full of, you know, beautiful colonials or bungalows or whatnot, um, this would have really stood out like a sore thumb. Uh, in Glenn Adamson's book, he has a quote of saying that the neighbors thought that it was their favorite Greyhound bus terminal in the neighborhood. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's very, it's concrete, right? And so, again, very modern, um, you know, touches to it. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting uh, and very rootsy. Um, a couple other examples of his designs. I mentioned um, the McCulloch uh, uh, Corporation. This is their uh, plant. I uh, believe in California, right, in 1946. So he did, uh, he helped McCulloch kind of redesign their entire plant facility, including, you know, interior furniture, meeting spaces, things like that. And so this is a rendering um, for that plant design. Um, and then, again, as part of his work with Miller Brewing, he helped design their new um, headquarters in Milwaukee. And so this is an exterior shot uh, of the actual building in 1951. So. All right, and I did want to talk for just a couple of minutes. Um, you know, if you were just to go online, Google Brooks Stevens, um, what, what always comes up first is this concept of planned obsolescence. And we would be, you know, remiss to not talk about it briefly. And so um, if you haven't heard of this term, it's still around. Um, and really it's the notion that, you know, a lot of um, these mass produced, you know, things we use every day uh, are designed to fail, right? And that we have to buy the newer, better, sexier version of that thing, um, you know, uh, well in advance of what could have been a longer lived item. And so, um, so it's purposely designing things to kind of have a short lifespan. Um, and Stevens was quoted as saying, our whole economy is based on planned obsolescence. We make good products, uh, we induce people to buy them, and then the, uh, the next year we deliberately introduce something that will make these products old fashioned out of date. And he's right. Um, and I think we can, we can have opinions about this, right? Um, but I think uh, he saw it as, okay, that's true, right? Um, but at the same time, those products that are no longer in fashion um, can be sold to somebody who may not be able to buy something brand new. It's a driver of the economy that helps create jobs, right? Um, there were many people who disagreed with him on this. Um, and so we have kind of a, a magazine article um, with uh, Walter Dorwin Teague, who was a big critic of this notion. Um, and I think Stevens was taken out of context quite a bit. I don't think he was saying, you know, let's go fill up the landfills and let's, you know, um, just waste, waste, waste. Uh, buy the newest thing, come on. Um, I think, you know, this is a concept, a, a term that he coined and has since kind of come to encompass this larger issue. And so um, it's interesting, um, but I, I, I wanted to bring it up because I don't, I don't want us to just remember him for this concept, right? I think he had a much longer, richer career and had more contributions to um, design than just this idea of planned obsolescence. All right, um, so his legacy, right? Uh, he died in 1995, um, so he lived uh, quite a long life, um, was very, very busy up until the end. Um, he had actually passed on ownership of the company um, to his son, uh, who managed it for many, many years in Wisconsin. 
Um, and he was still an avid lecturer, I and mean, he was a lecturer his whole life, talking in front of trade groups and whatnot. And he became a teacher uh, and was still drawing, still designing up until his later, later years. And so, um, you know, I think it's important just to, to think about the sheer number of things that one man can design in his lifetime, right? And I think, you know, you look at the history of American design, um, and again, you don't know his name necessarily, but he was such a big part um, of sort of the built and, and design environment that you still think of. And I love this cartoon on the left here. This is from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in 1995. You know, we have uh, now back to funeral procession with all the things that, um, that he designed. Um, and so we're thrilled. We thought now was really a good time to, to do this exhibit here. Um, you know, we have four vehicles on loan and four of our own vehicles uh, on display uh, and some other items as well. Um, so I encourage you to go upstairs and then check that out. Um, but a uh, really remarkable man, a remarkable career. And uh, I think that might be, oh, I have one more quote here um, from his son. Uh, New thoughts and ideas every day. Um, think of the concepts he came up with in his lifetime. Um, so many thousands of clients, many thousands of I believe that might be it. So thank you all for your attention. Now, if you have questions, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, and then I know we have, the museum is open uh, and we'll be doing punch and cookies. Yeah, right so, yeah, I wasn't happy. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? Yes, John. Was the Brooks Stevens Gran Turismo originally black and white? The, the, the image you saw? Yeah, he, I think when he bought it, he knew it was black and white. That, that particular car was black and white. It's been repainted, obviously. Yeah. Originally, it was white with the black top. But right. Yeah. I think it's what was in the picture right yeah. here. Anyway, it's another question. Yeah. Hey, hi. Um, the two race cars uh, that you showed there from Excalibur, do you know if they still exist? I don't know. Do you know what I mean? The, yeah, the Excalibur. Yeah, the, the one on the bottom there, Brian, right. yeah. There's a better color image I can find for you that shows that car. I, 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 I think they both are, but they are in the price range. Yeah. The, the other one that was interesting was the, the electric car, the Bridge of Stratton. Yeah. Especially yeah. with the, you know, today's environment. I'm not sure why yeah. they chose six wheels for that. I think it must have been a week. Red acid Red acid Wait, there you go. Yeah. yeah. The uh, Excalibur race car, what were the bodies? I believe it was aluminum. At least I know the Henry J one was aluminum bodies, yeah, because they wanted to be light so they could be, and they competed against other European race cars, right? Um, and so that really wasn't, I would say, road worthy, but it was designed to, you know, you could drive it on the road too if you wanted to. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, Brian, you know, I guess we're good. Thank you all so much. Different by design.